let's move on to protein. So first of all, let's give you some background about protein. And you know, there's there's always going to be debate over the protein requirements of athletes and individuals. A few general rule of, rules of thumb. One, muscle contains about 40% of the protein in the human body. And because of this, it's led people to believe that eating dietary protein correlates directly to building larger muscles. And that could not be further from the truth. In fact, eating protein doesn't build muscle at all. The stimulus of exercise, that ultimately builds muscle. And of course, I'm not saying that protein is unimportant in this process. It's absolutely crucial in the rebuilding and the recovery process. But in and of itself, protein does not build muscle. The building blocks of protein are actually called amino acids. And remember that every single protein is made up of a variety of amino acids uniquely linked together by something called peptide bonds. And again, we're not going to you're not going to be talking to your clients about peptide bonds, most likely. But what's important is the linkage that makes up the protein or that, makes, that, that links the amino acids together is actually what makes the protein unique. So, for example, a piece of steak versus a piece of tofu versus a piece of salmon, the combination is all going to be, is going to be different, and that's what makes up the specific food. So there's actually 20 amino acids required by the body. And the combination of more than 100 amino acids actually makes up a protein. So what would happen is the 20 amino acids will repeat in a protein when linked together. So think about a chain linked fence as an easy example. So if you think about the linking of a chain link fence that holds it together, that is just like the structure of a protein. Now there's both essential and non-essential amino acids. Now what's important is the definition of these. So essential amino acid is something that means the body cannot produce it by itself. It therefore must be consumed through the diet. On the other hand, a non-essential ingredient, in this case amino acid, does not mean, it doesn't mean it's unimportant, but the body can produce it. Therefore, it's not technically required from the diet because the body can make it in and of itself. Now, foods provide both essential and non-essential amino acids, and some foods called complete proteins provide a combination of all 20 of those amino acids. And you can see the chart on the, on the screen of the essential amino acids and the non-essential amino acids. Notice in the essential category, there are eight different, there's actually nine different amino acids. One of them, though, um, actually is not essential for everybody, depending on the... the um, the age of the person, it makes it essential or non-essential. So histidine cannot be synthesized by children and some older adults. It is essential in these populations. However, most adults can synthesize it. Again, you know, we're talking technicalities here, but it's important to give a proper background so you have the best information to then pass to, along to your clients. And you can see the chart of the essential and the non-essential amino acids, but do keep in mind that all proteins, our proteins are made up of a variety of both types. I mentioned the term complete protein, and animal and plant proteins actually differ considerably in the proportion of essential and non-essential amino acids. So animal proteins contain very high amounts of the essential amino acids, on the contrary, plant proteins, things like uh, legumes, rice, grains, they are actually low in one or more of those essential amino acids. And in this case, it's called the limiting amino acid. Protein that offer a complete amino acid profile are sometimes referred to as these complete proteins. Again, I said that earlier. And on the other flip side, Ones that do not provide all the essential amino acids are referred to as incomplete proteins. That does not mean they are bad for you by any means. It just means they don't provide all the amino acids that are required. One group of individuals, vegetarians, that therefore have to be cautious about the quality, particularly cautious about the quality of the proteins they are consuming. Because again, the proteins that are not coming from animals are, there, are missing one or more amino acids. That doesn't mean they can't get them. It just means they have to eat 
ensure they're eating a variety of foods. So, you know, if a client happened to be a vegetarian, you know, one, I would make sure you're working in conjunction with a registered dietitian who is familiar with these needs. Um, but you can also complement those services of the nutrition, the true nutrition expert, the, the dietitian, by, you know, providing some information on, you know, quality plant proteins, grains, bread, beans, oats, all of those things, when, when eaten in conjunction, offer this, again, this complementary protein. So when one food may be limiting in one amino acid, another food may have that, but may be limiting in a, limited in a different one. So eaten together, they work in conjunction, and therefore you have a complete protein. One important point that I think is important, that's interesting to emphasize, is that it used to be believed that when someone is a vegetarian, and again, they need to make sure they're eating these complementary proteins, the original school of thought was that they had to eat these complementary proteins together. So, for example, rice and beans at the same meal. It's now understood that as long as proteins are consumed within a, about a 24-hour period, then the individuals can have it can get a sufficient amount of those amino acids so again it's not just they have to be eaten at the same time but as long as they're kind of eating within the same time period about 24 hour hours or so so again take home message it's very very possible to consume adequate sources of high quality proteins even if someone is a vegetarian but there's a few crucial important points that i want you to uh, take home one important to make sure enough calories are being consumed on a daily basis. Two, there is sufficient variety in the diet. And number three, diets must be sufficiently planned to ensure protein adequacy. And again, looking at that third point, um, it's, it's most, uh, it'll be most useful to partner with a registered dietitian who is familiar and comfortable with working with vegetarian diets to adequately plan that protein. Um, but again, it's very, very, can be very healthy as long as the nutrition is planned out properly and a smart, uh, people are being smart about their intake. You heard in the beginning that, you know, there's a lot of confusion and misinformation, frankly, about protein needs. And it is well established that endurance, strength, and strength and endurance combined trained athletes do have higher protein needs than sedentary individuals, or often what I like to call desk jockeys. Similarly, growing teenage athletes and those just beginning exercise programs actually have higher needs as well because their bodies are really going under major uh, repair and rebuilding. However, there's a lot of debate on this, focusing on the specific requirements for each group of athletes or individuals. So I want to talk about what the, what the science shows. And this, I'll tell you that the science does not show that protein is the only necessary nutrient for building muscles. What it does show is that the needs are slightly higher. So let's first look at endurance athletes. According to the most current up-to-date science literature that we have, training may actually have what's known as a protein-sparing effect, which is interesting. That's contrary to popular belief. And in fact, the more seasoned an athlete, or meaning the more better trained they are, the lower the protein breakdown and use for energy during exercise. So again, their protein needs are not as high as somebody who is newly kind of out in the gym or out on the, on the, on the track or what have you. So protein supplies actually very little energy to the body, only about 5 to 15% during resting conditions. And this actually decreases during exercise, where in fact your body breaks down protein during exercise. Now, it is typically recommended that endurance athletes increase the intake of protein to 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight which translates to about 0.6 to 0.7 grams per pound of body weight. And, you know, we'll show you that on a slide in just a second. On the flip side, we have strength athletes. And unlike endurance athletes, resistance exercise does not increase the rate of protein oxidation or breakdown. Now, research suggests that strength athletes need approximately 1.5 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight in protein and again, to make it easily easy, that translates to 0.7 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. 
And then you can see on the chart here, we have what, what that actually looks like compared to what the, what the recommended dietary allowance says for sedentary adults versus just a general recreational athlete and then again endurance and also strength trained athletes. So you can see the protein needs do increase above and beyond a sedentary adult. However, it is not the be all and end all for gaining muscle weight. Now let's make this math really easy for you. I want to give you an example for a 200 pound weightlifter and how much protein they would need. They would need approximately 0.7 to 0.8 grams of per pound of body weight and that's what I mentioned. So that range would mean they would need to consume about 140 to 160 grams of protein per pound of body weight, or excuse me, per day. So 140 to 160 grams using that range. And you know, that's the most current science we have. So very often what you see in popular press and, and uh, literature shows much higher requirements than that. But you know, we have to go back to the science and see what actually works in the real life settings. And that they, in this case, that's the recommendation that we have. So just like carbohydrates, though, it's not just the quantity of protein that matters, but you know, let's also look at the quality. And as you can see, the chart we have here, just like I set up the chart for the carbohydrate needs, we have select most often, select moderately, and select least often. And you can see in the category on the left, we have those protein choices with the, um, they're all, high nutrient um, yet lower fat protein choices so beans chicken breast or turkey breast um, dairy products like milk that's lower non-fat dairy products salmon tofu um, all of those sources are great and can consume be consumed regularly but again don't go overboard don't you don't need to overdo it